Hey everybody, so we have an art hotline Bling. where we answer your questions about art, life, and the intersection of the two. And we got a lot of great questions, so today we're going to answer some of them. Uh, the first question comes from Anonymous. Lots of people didn't leave their names. Feel free to leave your name. Or not. One of my favorite artists for the past few years has been James Trail, um, and I'm not really sure how I feel about um, the situation regarding Drake. Don't really know whether to take it as a positive or a negative, so I'd like to know your opinion on it. Okay, Sarah, full disclosure, I, I did not know that there was a problem with James Terrell and Drake. So there's not really a problem per se, but when Drake's video for Hotline Bling came out, it, Great became, video. it became pretty clear to people in art circles that the backgrounds looked a lot like James Terrell installations. Mm. And Terrell did not sanction the use or did not collaborate with him in any way. Also, Drake visited the LA County Museum of Art the year prior to see James Terrell's exhibition and took pictures of himself and posted them to Instagram inside of those installations. I think we're always borrowing from other artists and other makers in different ways, and I usually tend to fall on the side of being more lenient and letting people play with, uh, with material. Yeah, for me, that's the way that uh, art happens in the first place is people learning from each other and experimenting based on other people's work. And if you don't allow for that, then in a way, I think you cut off a lot of what's best about contemporary art making. But Drake did rip off Terrell. Yeah, but I don't have a problem with it. I've been trying to become a full-time artist now for like three years or so, and now I'm in New York. I don't know where I'm going. How do you find an art-related job in New York? Oh man, Eduardo, this one, this one's hard. It's really hard to make art and make a living from it, especially in New York City. Yeah, there's an incredible tension between uh, uh, the making of art and the sort of necessary commercialization of art that is required to continue making art. Yeah, you kind of have to have luck, um, talent, usually, <laughs> uh, and then and then perseverance yeah. to just hold in there. But then other times I think you should just leave New York City. There are other places to make art. There are other places to find an audience. I just have this question that I wanted to ask because I've been thinking about it. And it's whether or not we should consume, watch, or experience art from people who've done really bad things. Examples include The Cosby Show, Anything by Roman Polanski, you can think of others. Uh, I'm really conflicted about this, so I'd love to hear your answer. First off, Evan, I love your show. So do I. Yeah, there's a link in the video info below if you want to check it out. And you seem like a good person, so at least there's no conflict there for me. I think this is a really good, hard question, and I don't necessarily know the answer. But the first thing I would think about in the case of The Cosby Show is should an ensemble effort be punished because of the terrible actions of one person involved. The other complexity here is that, of course, we're talking about a continuum. On the far end, you have someone like Bill Cosby or Roman Polanski, who've done truly, truly terrible things. But, you know, along the way, almost every piece of art was made by someone who's done something bad. So the question is more, where do I personally draw the line? And I feel like, ultimately, that's a personal decision. But I think the moral of the story is don't be a terrible person person and do bad things so that people can appreciate your art and not feel conflicted about it. That's one solution. Just make everyone in the world not be terrible. Be a better person. <laughs> Hello, this is Jamie from Ottawa, Canada. I was just calling, just love the show, and I wanted to know what your opinions are on graffiti and street art. In short, I like street art and graffiti art. I think it's great. Mm, yeah, see, I'm more torn because I feel like sometimes street art and graffiti art is just, it's just vandalism. Well, there's good graffiti art and there's bad graffiti art, and I think you have to evaluate it for what it is. You have to think about where it is, whom it vandalizes, uh, who its audience is. You have to evaluate it within the circumstances of it being street art. All right, now you made me feel less torn. How the heck do art teachers from the elementary to the college level, you know, beyond, Great art. I think this is a great question, and I think one of the reasons we've seen arts education in the U.S. decline in the last few decades is that it's very hard to quantify, and we live in this world where everything must be quantified in education. That's true, because most of art grading is so subjective, and I think everybody involved in arts education knows that. Whether or not they'll admit it is another thing. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's hard to talk directly about when it comes to art is that some art is objectively better than others. Uh, yeah, no, I strongly believe this. 
Like, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is objectively a better novel than An Abundance of Catherines. That's not modesty, that's a fact. I think that people really like to rank and quantify and order things, but I wouldn't discount the opinion of someone who really didn't like Huckleberry Finn and who loved An Abundance of Catherines. I don't think they're wrong. It's their opinion. I disagree with them, but it's valid. Mm, I'm not sure that it <laughs> is valid. We're gonna have to take this offline. Yeah, clearly. But in some, I think even though it's hard to quantify, you still have to try to make those judgments and not be afraid of it being a subjective exercise. I'm really curious what you think of the blending of books as art sometimes. Like Mark Zdanielewski, who has a lot of visual novels, typography setting, and color changes and font changes and stuff like that. I'm also thinking of like Jonathan Safran Fuller, who did Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, and uh, Tree of Codes, which is that like die cut book. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Austin, I really love the interplay between the world of art and the world of books. One of my favorite artworks of all time is Tauba Auerbach's RBG Color Space, which is not only a book, but it's a beautiful, amazing sculpture. And in your question, you mentioned both Mark Danielewski and Jonathan Safran Foer, and I'm really interested in the way that artists and authors can use the kind of constraints and opportunities of the physical book to make something new and interesting. I'm a huge fan of the uh, designer Rodrigo Corral, who actually illustrated the cover of my novel The Fault in Our Stars, and he did a really fascinating multimedia kind of YA novel slash art piece. Uh, I love that stuff. And I also think in this, the digital age, when so many people are reading on e-readers, uh, authors and publishers have to make a case for why it should be a physical book. Yeah, I think you've got to make physical books beautiful and wonderful to spend time with. They're a good technology. They're underrated. There's often a misconception about people getting a degree in art because, you know, there's a common misconception that, you know, it's a degree that you won't use. And I was wondering what jobs are available who study this instead of, you know, being a traditional artist, but being in the art field. So I majored in art and John in English, and those are both degrees often ridiculed as being useless. For the record, I double majored. My second major was in religious studies with an emphasis on early Islamic history. Totally useful. But I actually think that was very useful and that you draw on that knowledge all the time. Yeah, totally. And I would, that would be my answer to the question. The kinds of jobs that you can get with a degree in the liberal arts are very similar to the kinds of jobs that you can get, you know, just in general. You can sell insurance. You can go to law school. If you want to, you can go back to college, take a couple chemistry classes, and then become pre-med. I think we often forget that a liberal arts degree is not professional school. You're not learning a particular skill. You're learning how to think. You're learning how to approach problems. Yeah, and I would say that rather than preparing you for one particular career, a liberal arts degree prepares you for lots of different careers. Now, that comes with its own downsides, of course. I remember in the weeks after I graduated from college, in one week I applied for a job as a religion teacher, a paralegal, and a paramedic. <laughs> and the other thing I'd say is that there's this uh, misconception that you're going to do something with your life. People always ask me, what should I do with my life, as if you're only going to do do one thing. You're going to do lots of things with your life, so don't worry too, too much about, like, the one thing that you want to do, because if you're lucky, and most of us are, you're going to get to do lots of things. Thanks, everybody, for calling our art hotline. Bling. And we'll be making more of these videos, so please call in with your questions and comments. Yeah, it's wonderful to uh, read your comments, of course, but there's just something really special about hearing your voices, so thanks to everyone who's called into the hotline. Bling. See you next time. You would have been a terrible paramedic. I you would have been like, panic, panic, everybody! He's really hurt. I actually thought that <laughs> I actually thought you were gonna say that I would make a terrible paralegal because I would also make a terrible <laughs> paralegal. I'm not detail oriented, and I'm not a finisher. In addition to that, I would have been an awful religion teacher. It's no wonder that I didn't get any of those three jobs. <laughs>